you, Joanna. Well, good afternoon, everybody. As it was Joanna's great pleasure to introduce me, it is my even greater pleasure to be here with you today and to talk about work that, um, that she and I are working on together and to tell you a little bit about the TPACS project and the work that the Institute for Global Tobacco Control is undertaking to create a global surveillance system for tobacco packaging. Um, and through um, the presentation today, um, what I'd like to do is spend quite a bit of time talking about why TPACS is important. There are several people here um, in this room who spend their lives, um, or at least their working lives, on this project. And I'd like to spend some time um, discussing with all of us why it is that we, why it's so important that we're doing this work and what it's all for. Um, and then to describe to you just what we're doing and, um, and our processes for collecting these data and for making them available to the global tobacco control community. Um, and then to spend the last portion of our time together talking about um, what's being learned, beginning to think about what's being learned from this project, and um, then to, I think, open up the discussion to what are the possibilities for using these data to really move the needle um, in um, relation to global tobacco control and um, tobacco marketing, specifically with a focus on product and packaging. So that's where we're going today. Um, and this work was supported by a grant from the Bloomberg Initiative to reduce tobacco use to the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. So um, this is um, one way to represent the TPAC study. This is our homepage from our website, our online archive, searchable archive of tobacco packs from the 14 countries. And I'm going to call, come back and talk more about this, but just so we're all on the same page, this is, this is one way to think about TPACs. The, the dots that you see here are, um, represent the countries um, where we did data collection. And um, will I, I'm not going to walk you through a live um, presentation of the website, but I will talk more about um, our, on, our archive and the fact that ultimately the real purpose of this is to get our data into the hands of people who can make a difference in the, in the countries that we work in. Um, and so this is um, one of the, this is just an, um, a home page, that's not, it's not the home page, it's one of the pages um, once you get into our website that shows um, the, some of the different packs that, um, and here we have different Marlboro packs from um, Ukraine, I think these may these may all be from Ukraine, but just um, you can click on these packs and go into all of the packs that, we ha that we've collected and eventually we'll have more data on, we have some basic data on the um, packs right now and that we'll be adding to that over time. So more detail to come, but for those of you who are less familiar with T-Packs, this gives you just a little bit of a sense of, of, um, of one of the products of this project. Okay, um, and to give you another sense of this project, in addition to Joanna and myself, um, the TPACS team um, includes um, our coding, our great coders in the middle, um, Ad Adami Osho, uh, Ashley Conroy, Cerise Kleb, and Laura Kurat, who are all here today. And in addition, we have Carmen Washington, Jenny Brown, and Jackie Ferguson, who, um, without whom none of this would be possible. So hats off to you all, TPACS team. This is such an incredible group effort, so I thank you all. Um, and all questions after my talk should be presented to one of the other TPACS team members, please. Um, if you don't do it, I probably will. Um, so I thought I would start um, talking about the rationale for this project with a little bit of a personal flavor um, and of why the work that I do in tobacco control is so meaningful to me and then specifically thinking about this work in relation to um, the importance of marketing in the tobacco pack. So I did have a picture of my grandma up here, um, the grandma who I was named for, Catherine Clegg. Um, I was really closer, but I kept crying every time I had it on there. Um, my grandma died when I was 10 um, from tobacco-related diseases. Um, and, yeah. Okay, um, and that's really sad for me. It's really sad for my entire family. She was a great person. She was a really funny person and a wonderful grandmother. Um, the, she smoked Vantage, and that's the pack on the right, and I can still see that pack on the coffee table next to her crossword book 
um, puzzles, and I can see it. I can, I can, I can see it, and it, it was a big part of her life. And when I went back, and that bullseye is just something. I mean, I haven't seen this for 35 years, and I can still picture it in my mind. It's a very powerful image. Um, and when I went back to find this image, I found I found televised commercials, which is hard to imagine that they that they had those in the 70s, and they did. And I found that actually um, Vantage was um, marketed to the smoker who wanted the full flavor of tar but also wanted to take advantage of new filter technology, which made me so sad and mad because it was well known that those filters did nothing. And by the mid-1970s, my grandmother was already suffering extensively from emphysema, couldn't quit, wanted to quit, was smoking Vantage. Um, and so, and the pack is still in her, grandmother, in her, her granddaughter's mind over 30 years later. On the left is a picture um, from Times Square, um, and from, again, from the 70s. Um, what, I, what I wanted, hoped to find was a picture from the Santa Ana Freeway, which is actually the freeway that we used to take out to my grandma's house. Um, but I couldn't find one. Um, but this, is, this does the same thing. Um, this is the Winston Man. I don't know if any of you remember this. This was an awesome billboard. Um, it used to blow smoke rings. And, um, and so when we used to go see my grandma, I remember two billboards in this Southern California. That it was filled with billboards. But the two billboards I remember are the smoking billboard and the Mattel billboard. The Mattel billboard was really important to me because that was the home of Barbie. Um, and this one was really um, memorable to me because it was just the coolest thing out there. So um, thinking about just how powerful tobacco marketing is and how important it is. And, um, Increasingly, thinking about the pack in relation to the way that the tobacco companies, increasingly that's their mechanism that they have left to communicate really important messages with the smokers, with smokers and potential smokers. So the importance of cigarette branding, um, smoking cigarettes is a highly um, socially visible activity. Cigarettes are thought of as um, badge products. They are um, something that says something about you in the consumption of them. Um, and that's a really important thing to know about cigarettes. It's, people smoke a particular brand because uh, people smoke because it's highly addictive, um, but they smoke a particular brand because, as well as the um, constituents of the cigarette, because also because the brand says, speaks to them in some way. And in consuming the brand, often in public, it says something to others about them. Um, so cigarette brands um, embody the qualities that people wish to have, the lives that they wish they could leave, and the great escapes that they wish they could make is, um, is something that has been said about um, cigarette brands. So here we have we, demonstrations of some pretty um, powerful brands that you'll all know. Um, and what uh, Melanie Wakefield uh, described about um, cigarette brands and products is when a user displays a bra badge product such as a a cigarette, this is witnessed by others providing a living testimonial endorsement of the user on behalf of that brand and product. So it really says something about you, what brand you smoke. Just showing how important, brand, important branding is to the whole process of marketing of cigarettes, of cigarette consumption. So thinking about the global, now moving a little bit from branding and um, to the issue about why is it important to be doing this work in the countries that we're working in and thinking about the global burden of tobacco. Um, a few basic statistics about, um, about tobacco um, and, the, and the health burden in a global context. It, tobacco um, remains a leading preventable cause of death. Um, it kills approximately six, six million people a year. And increasingly, those deaths occur in low- and middle-income countries. About 80% of tobacco-related deaths um, occur in low- and in middle-income middle countries. And I was just, um, just yesterday, I heard something about um, craft, that craft is now, which I work, um, some, a lot of the work that I do is in relation to food as well as tobacco, and this is one of these areas that comes together. Um, craft is just... Um, merged with Heinz. And one of the reasons that they've done that is because increasingly as Americans become more health conscious of what they feed their kids, the craft profit margin is declining in the US. Um, but it's recognized that there's a whole world out there for craft to grow into because um, feeding your kid craft products is aspirational in a lot of places. And so it is for tobacco as well. It's a very similar sort of thing. So thinking about how is, there, how is a market, an, in, 
an increasing market being created for tobacco globally um, and thinking about the, wor the role that branding plays in that. And I think that's really critical to the work that we're doing in the TPACS project is understanding the communication that happens, the aspiration that happens through the tobacco pack. It, what's also critical um, to the work that we're doing in the TPACS project is thinking about what are the effective policies that we can put into place to reduce the um, burden of tobacco use around the globe. And we know increasingly what we need to be doing to really restrict the tobacco, um, the tobacco market, to restrict demand for tobacco as well as, um, as put restrictions on the supply side. And here, so we have the, uh, just make quick reference to the framework convention um, on tobacco control uh, and the articles um, 6 through 13 that really are aimed to reducing the demand for products um, and including, so this includes things like increases in taxation, smoke-free policies, restrictions of advertising and product content, education campaigns, cessation services, control of packaging and labeling, and in our project, so that's a whole basket, an array of different policies, all of which are important to put into place. Um, in, um, together in combination with one another. And in this project, we're particularly um, focused on um, the implementation of Article 11, which is the article that requires that parties implement effective tobacco packaging and label measure, labeling measures to increase public awareness of the negative health impacts of tobacco products. So essentially, the warning labels um, and restrictions to um, deceptive practices on tobacco products. So that's, from a policy perspective, that's some of the important context for the work that we're doing in the TPACS project. Um, I want to spend a little bit of time on this slide um, thinking about marketing restrictions more generally um, and where the world is going in terms of restricting the opportunities for, to, for cigarettes and other tobacco products to be marketed. So, we don't see the same billboards, the smoking, um, the, uh, the smoking billboards that we used to in the U.S. We don't, we no longer have um, cigarette commercials on TV in, um, in the U.S. And, and increasingly globally, there are restrictions that are being placed on marketing and promotional efforts for tobacco products and cigarettes and tobacco products. Um, and this is work from um, Lisa Hendrickson's, uh, this is work from Lisa Hendrickson that shows um, down the y-axis here, you see um, different areas of marketing. And actually, interestingly, pa the pack isn't listed here. Um, but different, so whether there's mar advertising in television and radio, magazines, outdoor advertising, direct mail, um, branded merchandise. And, for the, um, and you see a, a range across the x-axis of um, high-income countries as well as low- and middle-income countries. Um, and the circles that are um, darkened circles are um, countries where there is um, more complete restriction um, in that area. So increasingly, um, we are the, there's constri constri con um, restrictions on what how the tobacco company can build that brand image and can start to build loyalty um, among smokers and potential smokers for their pro their particular product and get people. Um, Get, tobacco, get cigarettes seen to be an aspirational product, something that you'd want to consume um, in a social situation. So there's increasingly sort of restricted opportunities, which is why the tobacco, why the cigarette pack becomes so critical. Um, so increasingly things like um, sponsorship, outdoor billboards, um, marketed uh, mer merchandise, wearable merchandise, um, co-branding, all of that is on, uh, is being is being challenged in different countries. And increasingly, um, that makes, as I've said, the cigarette pack a bigger part of how, a bigger, of more central importance in terms of how, um, how image and branding can be um, presented to the smoker. So here we have some examples. These are not from our um, TBAC study. Um, of um, These are older examples from Camel. These are advertised, um, these are magazine ads, and the reason that I, I like them and brought them in is actually they show how the cigarette pack is being um, tied into the actual ad. So there's sort of um, big imagery that's being presented in, um, in the ad itself, and then the actual um, cigarette, uh, the pack is there. So clearly these are, you know, these are from the days of Joe Camel. These are older, but it, I thought they were nice illustrations of, of 
of linking the, um, the product, linking the pack with the advertising. Um, so now let's, the image in the middle is from our, is from our, um, is a pack from our uh, TPACS um, study. And it shows how um, the, the pack um, can be a communication device, both for the tobacco companies as well as for tobacco control. So here you have, you know, what, um, and actually I put this in um, some time ago and um, the team was just talking about uh, this morning about how um, this particular pack is, we think, a particularly appealing um, camel pack with its zebra design, its hot pink camel in the middle, um, but also then um, this is from Mexico and it has the communication of, of the health message here as well. So the pack can communicate an awful lot and um, from tobacco control purposes what we really want to be doing is eliminating this kind of communication and maximizing this, oops, <laughs> this kind of communication. Um, as much as possible. So we really want to be focusing on how do we make effective and um, have communication that's about the health messaging rather than the branding. Okay, so now let's talk. So that's um, hopefully enough to get you thinking about the rationale for this work. Now I'm going to spend some time talking about exactly what we're doing and how we're doing it. So as I said, we're doing a um, surveillance, a global su surveillance um, project and um, initiative, and ultimately we're doing analyses um, of health warning compliance as well as um, as well as appeals and features of the the packaging and the design. Um, and we're also making um, our data and the packs themselves available to um, people working, tobacco control advocates working in the countries that, um, that these data are from. Um, so we're assessing ultimately in terms of the work, the analytic work that we're doing um, at IGTC, we're assessing compliance with existing health warning laws and we're describing and um, we're seeking to describe and understand the distraction that zebra print distraction um, that's going on um, and the marketing that's taking place in this on the packs, the, um, the work that's uh, occurring to build um, and strengthen and build a global tobacco market um, through the use of the packs. So um, we have completed one round of data collection. We're preparing for our second round of data collection um, for the TPACS study. Um, in 2013, we uh, di conducted data collection in all 14 countries, which was, which was a Herculean effort. Um, Carmen and Jenny, between them, um, wrapped the globe um, several times um, to train and work with our data collectors in each of the countries. Um, and um, for each of the countries, uh, we created a, we had a sample of three different cities that we went to. I've just shown Pakistan here as um, an, example uh, an example country and set of cities. Um, we chose cities um, to be diverse, uh, maximum variation for pop in terms of their population. Um, so we, we went to highly populated cities, but we also went to cities that were in some way distinct from one another. Um, and um, so we went to 14 countries. Um, across those 14 countries, we went to 44 cities. And in each of the cities that we went to, we went to 12 neighborhoods. Again, seeking within a particular city to get maximum variation in terms of, um, particularly in terms of socioeconomic status of people that, um, that lived, in, um, and, um, lived in and were, if we think about cities, a lot of cities um, are where people spend time, not necessarily where they live. So thinking about the characteristics of the parts of the cities and diversity um, in terms of the types of people that live and use those areas of the city. So we ended up in 528 neighborhoods. And through this process, um, we collected a, um, a sample of 3,328 um, tobacco packs. Um, most of them are cigarette packs. But we also have, um, from some of the countries, beaties. We have some cigarillos. We have some cretex. Um, and so, but the majority of our packs are cigarette packs. And um, we can answer, and notice I say we there, um, any more questions that people have about the data collection, um, where we went, and what we collected in the questions. 
We worked, it's important I think to um, point out that we worked with um, local data collectors um, to conduct this work. So we partnered with in-country agencies to, um, to collect the data in each of the countries. And these are just some images that represent some of the work that we did um, with the local partners in a few of the countries um, to uh, identify where we should be going in cities, to actually do the purchasing um, on our behalf as well as to start to create our archive and our database um, through the uh, taking of images of each, a set of standardized images for each of the packs. Um, so what do we actually do? Um, what was our, what do we do for the, um, in the purchasing? Uh, and our data collection for any country began with an, in an initial city, um, which was the city that, which was, um, which is a large city and was the city that um, our, our in-country partners were um, were located in. So we started in there in the home city, um, and we started with a large purchase. Um, and what that means is that we went to the first store. We selected a store that would have a lot of packs, um, and we bought one of everything they had. Um, so we went into the store, and we had a system where we would actually look. Um, in fear, it, it worked a little bit differently in different places, but if you can imagine it, if you think about a display of cigarette packs, we would start at the top left-hand corner and go along and bought every different manifestation of cigarette packs. So if they had tw 12 different kinds of Marlboros, they had Marlboro Red, uh, Lights, they had different, a pack of 20, a pack of 10, we would buy one of everything. We um, <coughs> recorded the price um, that was paid for each of the packs. Um, we cataloged um, all of the packs that we, that we bought in that particular store, which was no um, small effort. And then when we went out to our next store, um, we only bought packs in that store that we hadn't already got. So we filled, we, uh, we filled the gaps in, in, in other stores. Um, and that's how we actually went through um, each of the countries. So each of the neighborhoods that we went to, we were, in, we were just looking for packs that we didn't have. So it, after we collected in every store, we would go back, add that to our inventory, and then we would be looking for packs that we didn't already have. So that's how we went about getting our actual packs in each of the countries. Um, and then we had um, a process of creating a searchable archive, which, as I said, started in the field with, well, actually, it starts before we get to the field. It started with Laura coming up with a protocol um, for taking the images of the packs, um, providing all of the equipment that um, somebody could possibly need to take good images and take consistent images in the field, um, and then for Carmen or Jenny to train people in the field to actually take these images um, take these pictures consistent with our directions. And it worked um, better in some places than others, and we had to retake some images. But um, what, essentially, we have at least nine standard images. Um, for packs or, that were a little bit different, we would have more images. But we have at least nine of the same images of each of the packs um, for, each of, for each of our packs that are now up on, on our website. Um, so the, all of these photos and basic information about the packs are uploaded into our searchable archive on our website. And we are increasingly, as we code the packs, as we um, st look systematically and in a standardized way at um, the health warnings and compliance with, with country laws, as well as features and appeals, more of that information will be made available on the website um, to the in-country partners um, and to the global tobacco control community generally. So then we needed to get our packs back home. Um, and that was not as easy as one might think. Um, uh, lots of packs coming from lots of different countries um, and some strict um, restrictions in the U.S. About, the, uh, about importing cigarettes. So we worked with the FDA um, and as well as other agencies to get permission to bring the packs in for research purposes. We also worked with um, various different agencies in the countries and, um, and in between <laughs> um, to get our packs there. And we just actually, um, over a year later, have managed to get our last country's packs physically here. So we have all of our packs here. So they came, yes, um, they came by, they came, it's like planes, trains, and automobiles. And I think it's probably almost as dramatic a story. There was probably a polka band um, that was um, playing with one of our, with one of our um, packs as they came in. So um, getting the packs here, and we have the packs um, actually cataloged, and we have the physical packs here. And some of the work that we do is with the images, but actually a lot of the work that we do is best, best done holding the packs in your hand, even though that can be disgusting um, in terms of the, the smell and also some of the creepy crawlies that um, are in some of these things. But um, 
but they are actually here and we're working with um, both images and also the packs. So now the images that you see down the side are actually from, um, from oh, and let me go back. This in the middle here, I don't know how um, bright it is, he, um, but if you can see it, but here you see our packs are actually kept in, um, in baggies with some information um, in plastic boxes um, in, in our office space. Um, so the first thing, the first analytic task that we have, or the first preparation for anal analyzing these data that we have, is coding our packs for health, for, for compliance with the health warning label laws in their own country. So we create a code book, um, Jenny does, um, leads the efforts here for each of the countries um, to take their law and transfer it into rules for coding the, each of the packs. So at this point, it's not our job, it's not our intention to evaluate the impact of the, of the warning label. We want to see how consistent and adherent the tobacco packs are that we have to the law in any country. Um, we have we um, developed these code books using the data on the laws that, um, that the Center, uh, excuse me, Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids provides on their tobacco control laws um, website. Uh, and our coding is conducted um, by two independent coders, um, and that is Cerise and um, Adami, I believe. Um, and, um, and this is important because we actually have, it's not just one person's assessment of whether something's um, compliant, but actually we have two people independently assessing it. And then if, there's any, um, if there are any places where there, those, pe those coders are not consistent, we actually, um, we actually ha bring in a third adjudicator. Um, and we are keeping um, records and looking, using those records um, to con consistently evaluate and improve our coding system. Um, and so our coding inconsistencies, um, though those are rare, are um, calculated and um, reconciled. Um, and ultimately, we assess compliance um, with the health warning labels through these four different measures. Adherence to requirements about warning location on the pack, adherence to mandated warning size, adherence to um, the elements of the label, such as the color of the warning and the warning content, and adherence to mandated warning text size. Um, so, and um, I should say that we, this is limited to the subset of PACs in any country that have a current country lab, um, warning label on them. So we don't, we remove all of the PACs that we've purchased legally that do not have the warning labels on them, and then we just look at compliance with those packs that do have the warning labels. Are they actually compliant with the law as written? And here are some basic results um, from ten of um, from ten of our countries, um, according to those four different criteria. Um, so we can see different levels of um, different levels of compliance, and maybe that's something that if people would like to discuss. Um, discuss that later, we can do so, but just we are, um, these, these are the kinds of data that we are producing and that we're discussing with our tobacco control colleagues and thinking about the application for policy promotion. Um, so moving on to features and appeals, so thinking about how um, focus is being taken away from those warning labels and, um, and brand, and brand um, branding is, a, is occurring on the packs, and, um, and we look at the features and appeals of, of the different packs. So unlike health warning compliance, where we're looking at adherence to a country-specific policy or law, for the health features and appeals, we have built a single code book, and this is where our shout out goes to Laura who, um, and um, Ashley, who um, have, have done some fantastic work in creating this um, features and appeals code book um, that's based heavily on prior work that has been shown um, that has led us to um, highlight um, elements of packaging that have been shown to be impactful in terms of, of making connections with, um, with smokers and with vulnerable potential smokers. What, what, appeals, what, a, what appeals to people? Who are, what are the ways that um, the pack can be um, utilized to, to market to particular types of smokers or potential smokers? Um, and we, it's also important that we are able to code these objectively and consistently. So we've created a sort of um, a um, a, an approach that highlights the key elements, but also thinks about our thousands of packs and, um, 
and scientific rigor and um, looks at what we can actually apply consistently and, um, and, and, and objectively. And again, we have implemented our coding in teams of um, independent coders in teams of two, which all, um, all of the coding team that you saw um, earlier have been involved in. And at, we code in such a way that there are daily checks for consistency and reliability between the coders. So really maximizing the opportunity that if there, that we don't have, um, we don't have, we have fantastic um, inter-rater reliability and compliance, but where there are issues, we're able to identify those quickly, um, reconcile them, and improve, improve the coding system. So when I talk about features and appeals, what do I mean about, by that? Well, features, we're thinking about what, what's cool about the pack itself? What's nifty about this? Some of them have side openings, some of them have slides, they have all, they're, they're shiny, there's holograms, there's all kinds of things that make the, um, the packs particularly appealing. Um, and um, they, the sticks, the sticks, the the, the cigarettes themselves can be um, can have can have um, can have some neat elements. Um, and then the appeals, um, we're talking both about lexical, so the, with the words on the packs, as well as imagery. Um, and we here are just um, some things that I pulled out from all of the different things that we code for for um, appeals. Things like technology, so power buttons. Um, and I'll show you some more of those. I'll show you some of the work that, that, um, that we've been doing in that area. Things that are, you know, clearly feminine. So, you know, here we have this glamour with this pink flower. Um, calls to national pride or international aspiration. Um, as well as um, references to taste. Um, lots of animal, um, animal references, et cetera. So really thinking about all the um, different ways that these products can be made appealing and aspirational to people. So here's an example of some of those um, uh, particularly um, of, the, of the features of the packs for things that are, are really unusual um, and sort of move the pack from just being a sort of square with a top opening to, um, to things that are, are somewhat more interactive even. Um, and thinking about how those might be appealing. So a sliding pack, a slider with a fold out, we differentiate, and then um, things like boxes. So just to give you um, a sort of a taste of the kinds of things that we code for. So now talking just for a moment or two about some of the areas that we're starting to dive into. I talked a little bit about our health warning compliance work, and now for the final few slides, I'm just gonna, and these are, I will say poached from the work that, um, that the team has been doing and pre presenting at the World Conference on Tobacco Health, um, as well as Society for Research in Nicotine and Tobacco um, in the past month. Um, so these are the, this is our works in progress. Um, and so here we see um, the imagery, the technology, some um, technology appeals here. Um, so this sort of, cr the idea that there's a crush that can be in the filter um, that will actually um, infuse, you can smoke some of the cigarette and then infuse it with um, some flavoring of some kind, some mint or menthol. Um, so this sort of crush technology that's highlighted on a lot of the, um, on some of the packs. Um, and then here we see the power, um, sorry, this is very hard to, um, the power or play or skip buttons that are used um, in, uh, on, on some of the packs. And then the idea of sort of just making generally this idea of high tech imagery. Um, so we're seeing this as one of, this is one of the areas of sort of appeal that we think is really important to take a look at, seek to understand, um, and, and think about in more detail. Along the bottom here, we have um, work on, um, on thinking about one, one brand in particular, but it's, um, and this, we, Marlboro was the only brand that we found multiple um, brand variants of in all 14 of our different countries. So there's, a, in tobacco control, um, generally there's a lot of focus right now on brand segmentation and thinking about um, what are companies trying to do when you have um, 10, 15, 20 different variants of a particular brand in a, in a market. And what does that do and, and, and uh, what, how, does that, how does that play into the distraction? Um, and the branding creation. So our um, database lends itself really nicely to be able to look at things like that. Maybe think about them in a different way than other people have had the ability to do. Um, some work that um, we've also been um, 
interested in is that um, in f we took um, fairly early on into, I mean, we're still actually in the process of um, coding. We're, in, we're not through the coding of the 2013 data for either health warning um, labels or our features and appeals. We are increasingly, we have more and more countries checked off. Um, but w early on, one of the things that struck us was it's it really, it's really, um, it's really surprising, but it sort of hits you in the face how English is everywhere on these packs in these countries where English is not the official or even the dominant language. And so we, we wanted to look at that a little bit more. And actually, when we did that, we took a look at just five countries um, and found that over 80% and in some of the um, cases, almost all of the packs have English on them. And they, have, they can go from having English, everything's in English, to just sort of snippets of things are English. So we're trying to understand the, the, reason, the marketing purposes for the use of English in these packs. And I just pulled out one element of this here, um, because there's from the um, advertising literature, there's this idea of in, use of English um, for symbolic enhancement, the idea that English is aspirational. <laughs> Um, and uh, it can be aspirational in m many different ways. And we can see evidence of, of some of the ways in which others um, in advertising have talked about English being aspirational um, on our cigarette packs. Um, and we can also see some, some things that seem to be somewhat different. Um, so we, English can be used to convey luxury. Um, it's a, it, they, and we see, you know, um, Lincoln style and jet here as, you know, these are um, aspirational ideas. We are, um, we would argue, um, and we're looking at the idea of symbolic, the connections that are being made with the U.S. Um, through use of English. So, um, American legend here. I think this is text. This says here. So the idea that you know this is an American, a very American, and aspirational product. We also um, see clear connections to the U.K. to England, which. I think has some really interesting implications in terms of historical context and, um, and sort of colonial past of some of these countries and thinking about what is the aspiration, where's the aspirational English speaking country? Is it the US, is it the UK? And how is that being tie tied into? So that's just some early work around um, this. So now what's the, so what, thinking about policy applications and um, I just wanted to give, uh, where we, where we could and hope perhaps to be headed. Um, plain packaging, where, where there's no more distraction. It's all about the pack is being used for health messaging entirely. Um, these are packs from Australia that has led the way in plain packaging. Um, there are other countries that are on the verge of plain packaging policy and that we'll be seeing um, hopefully um, in the years to come. Australia now, just this week, I think, released um, is releasing data that showing that plain packaging works, that plain packaging has its intended effect. So, but we and in, um, in the U.S. and in lot in the countries that we're in, we're we're a long way from plain packaging. But our our TPAC study should help us understand better where we are, what the marketing Im potential marketing implications are, what the distractibility is, and when we don't have complete standardization of packaging, the plain packaging and standardization of packs, so you have to have a pack that is this dimensions, the sticks that are this particular size and that there can't be color on the stick and that you know, everything has to be standardized. What are some of the ways that policies that are in place that aren't those policies can be manipulated, can be got around? What are some of the ways that, that there will still be gaps and, and, and um, loopholes for companies to, to work with? to continue to brand and, um, and create connections with um, smokers and, and those around them that are, who are exposed to, um, to, their, to the products that they're smoking and the packs that they come in. So the final slide um, is just a thank you to, again, to the TPACS team um, who's been working so hard for the past um, over two years now to get us to this point. It's, and I think we're just at that point where we can start to see all the important things that are, are going to be coming out of this and all of the um, critical, um, critical applications. And I welcome discussion of, of both our process so far as well as thoughts about where we might go and what we might do with these, um, with these important uh, data. So thank you.
Okay, so um, two responses. So we, we, the protocol that we had was intended to maximize breadth rather than depth. Um, and, but, um, so we do, we have one of everything. But we do have data such as um, GATS data, Euromonitor data that can tell us which of, you know, we have a, a broad sample, which of those are, relate to the most highly smoked brand. So we, we, have, we have the ability to weight our data to the extent that that would be important using data on which are the most highly consumed brands. In addition, as we think forward to going um, into subsequent rounds of data collection, we're thinking about whether, what would be the value in possibly getting some depth um, so more than one pack in relation to the sort of most consumed brands. And we're exploring what are the different ways that we might go about that right now. So we're, we're, we're looking to, to address that going forward. Well, I think we have better, better data than that, that we can actually get data from on a national level as to which are the most popular brands from these countries. So I think that, that might be the way to go. Um, and then in relation to the, do we have the sticks? We do have the sticks. We have um, prioritized um, keeping the sticks in a way that works for us. Again, one of the things that we're thinking about going forward, so we've had these sticks in, in room temperature storage for the past two years. If there are, would be real utility in the sticks being stored in another way for other purposes, I think that's something that we're at the point when we go back into the field that we should be thinking about. And if that's something that we should follow up with you about, we'd be happy to do that. Yeah, Brian. The uh, idea of measuring compliance is really interesting to me. Some of your preliminary results showed, for example, Brazil was about 70% of the time uh -huh. compliant with the warning label. But obviously, there's, that's an absolute measure. And with some things, there might be some things that are more or less important. And also, Brazil has better warning labels than yeah. Canada. Yeah. It's a complicated message to report. It is a complicated message to report, and I don't know, jo Joanna, if you want to comment on that. I think it differs depending on whether you're thinking about what's the message, what's the utility of this finding for the country advocates, and thinking about, I think, um, maybe insight into where a really great policy may be being circumvented um, at times, but also thinking about if you're doing cross-national comparisons, certainly not wanting to lose the message that these, this is a stronger policy than this, but, but there still seems to be some issues in terms of getting it consistently applied. Oh yeah, so and the, that's, uh, Joanna's just um, mentioned that our compliance measure was very much based on FCTC elements. So that was, um, yeah. Other, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. The, um, the international marketplace is very different too, and I know it's early on in your analysis, but are you finding differences between um, dimensions of compliance with domestic versus imported cigarettes in the marketplace, or is that hard to discern? Yeah, so we, um, we, I don't think that we've thought about it exactly that way just yet. We are being careful to think about compliance with the health warning labels to the, to the packs that have a current country warning label on them. So our measures that we show, our numbers that we show are not of the entire pack sample. This is just of the, the, the but the cigarette packs that have a country, a, um, a current country warning label on them. But in terms of domestic versus international, I think that's something that we could look at. We just haven't gotten to that yet. And I think it would be of, in some countries it would be more important than in others. Yeah, Lauren. I'm just curious kind of how like you and your team are thinking about other tobacco products in relation to reports. I mean sort of if there's any lessons learned from Australia that you're aware of like how other products like dissolvables or smoke or tobacco might be like were into even heavier in response to clean packaging and kind of if you're thinking about something that being the future. I know you're collecting a ton already. Right. Um so I in terms of other products, I think we're really being led by two things. One, 
the products in a particular country that are highly consumed. So in countries like India and Bangladesh, we are thinking a lot about smokeless tobacco. Um, but also thinking about countries that have, that for, for um, products for which there is policy regarding health warning labels. So, where, um, so for products where there isn't a requirement to have a health warning label, that we feel at, right now that that falls outside of the scope of our study. Um, but again, as we prepare to go back into the field, we are thinking about those products that there's a health warning requirement and that are not, um, not marg highly marginal products, but are highly consumed products. Here, our chief. That, that's a great question and actually a great um, sort of prompt. Um, so we're, we're prioritizing going back to countries where there has been a change in the warning label. That's not always necessarily to the size, but some of, um, some of the, in some of the cases it will be. And so we will be able to, we would be able to look at that and that would be a great idea to look at. So one of the things that I didn't mention that we do in our process is that we um, look at not only when we get the packs in, not as a part of our formal coding, but in terms of trying to understand this body of, of tobacco, this, this data set that we have, um, we try and look at it lots of different ways. And one of the things that we do is we look at um, all of the packs from a particular brand that we have across countries. We lay them out on a table and we look at, we look at them. And thinking about how does that, how does that actually, how does, so we, we can actually look at the warning label size and thinking about thinking about how how the branding occurs in the restricted space and it's incredible what you can do with the top of a pack if that's all you have how you can actually still get very clear and very um, how restricted space does restrict space but it doesn't remove this you see in lots of instances the same elements of the branding in that reduced space Other questions? Yeah. Uh, in your theory, you include important countries in the world. Why you choose these important countries and why is that? Yeah, so those are the um, countries that are um, the focus of um, the Bloomberg, Bloomberg Philanthropies, the Global um, Tobacco. Um, the Institute for Global Tobacco's work um, in the context of Bloomberg Philanthropies. They're the countries that, um, they are countries that have um, very high, where the burden, where the burden is high. So they're, um, so they are, they're, they are, that's how we selected those countries. So we went to all of the countries that are within, um, within that project. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, that's one of the things that we're really interested in. And one of the, the challenges for us has been how do we know what's targeting women across cultural lines? Um, and so what is a feminine pack in um, Indonesia? How might that be different than a, um, than a feminine pack in China? Um, so that is something that we are, um, that we're coding for and that we will be looking at. And, um, and in particular, in terms of youth, what um, so we are seeing packs and we're identifying packs that we clearly um, see as youth appeal packs and, um, and more will come on that. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah.
So may, maybe I can start and Jenny and Carmen can correct me if I say anything wrong or add to it. Um, so I think that the, our primary goal in a store was to buy packs. So when your primary goal is to buy things from a store owner, you have less pushback. Um, and uh, the, we, whenever possible, we sought to get images. That wasn't always possible, and it wasn't our primary purpose for being in the store. So whether, when that created waves, we didn't, we didn't do it. Um, and I, my sense is that we, I don't believe that we were ever asked not to purchase from a store, correct? Um, and, but there were some stores that were less comfortable with us um, taking, taking images. And um, this, that first store that we went to in each of the countries where you know, we needed to spend quite a bit of time and to make a major purchase, um, as much as possible, we, um, we sought to um, seek a good time um, so that we wouldn't be disruptive. So you know, we were spending a lot of, you know, we were buying packs, so we didn't think that that would be a problem. But as long, oops, excuse me, as long as we came at the time that wasn't like their sandwich rush hour um, time or something like that. Did I say anything wrong? Anything to add? Yeah, I think for the, maybe the first country, we did write a script um, for our partner to kind of say to the owners or the uh, clerk if they asked a question, it would just basically explain that, you know, we're doing a study, we're looking at packs, we're working with this local organization, and that was it. We did have people, I recall, asking, are you working with the government? Are we going to get in trouble? And, you know, we just kind of just waited for them to know that. Mm -hmm. words to that effect, and I pulled out my iPhone to take a picture, and the store clerk said, that's against the rules, we don't allow that, and I thought that was ludicrous, and I just went to the next duty free shop, and then somebody beat the clerk in here. <laughs> <laughs> So you see, it's not only the tobacco companies that can engage in distraction. We can, too. <laughs> so um, thank you very much. Um, thank you.